Hey students, welcome to the second part of the first lecture of Linear Algebra 2. So in the first part we introduced the notion of a vector space, which was a set together with two operations, addition and scalar multiplications, and then we proved some properties. And in this part we will introduce a lot of notations, which are all familiar to you for the classical case when the vector space is given by the Rn, which were just vectors which had n entries. So and the first thing we want to introduce is a subspace of a vector space. So this is definition uh, one three. And in the following, V will always be a vector space So, a subset of a vector space U. This is called a subspace. Subspace of this vector space V. If we have three conditions which are exactly the same we had before in linear algebra 1, So the first condition is that 0 is in the subspace U, and by 0 I mean this, this special element, which is called this, this identity element with respect to the addition. So, and in the definition this is what we called N, but we also write a 0 for this. So this should be in U. And the second condition is that this space U is closed under addition, which means if I have two elements U and V in U, then also the sum u plus v is in u. And the third condition is that this space is also closed under scalar multiplication, meaning if I have an element u in u and the scalar, meaning a real number, then also the scalar multiplication lambda times u is in u. So this is, these are exactly the same uh, conditions we had before. And examples are, so I will do example, this is example number three. So one example is the following set, P, which are the functions from R to R such that these functions are polynomial functions. So for example, the function f of x equals no, no, 2 times x squared minus x minus 1. This f would be an element in this space. And this space, P, is a subset of C, and these were the continuous functions from R to R. And this was a subset of all functions from R to R. And one can check that this set P satisfies these three conditions. So the zero function is also an example for a polynomial function because it's just a polynomial of degree zero. And also if I have two polynomial functions and I use the addition of functions, then the sum is also a polynomial function. And also if I multiply a polynomial function with a number, then it will also be a polynomial function. And therefore this P is a subspace of this vector space, but it's also a subspace of this vector space. And one can also check that the space of continuous functions is also a subspace of all functions, because if I have two continuous functions and I add them, they, the sum is also continuous, and also if I multiply it with the scalar, and also the zero function uh, is a continuous function. And therefore we have various examples here of subspaces. And also, 
in example number one, we had one example which we called u. So u was a space of functions uh, inside this space such that the second derivative is again the function. And this is an example of a subspace of the space of continuous function, or it's also an example of a subspace of all functions. So this is the first example. So the second example is, uh, well, everything we did in linear algebra 1. So subspaces of Rn. So if V is Rn, then we had a lot of ways to get subspaces. For example, the kernel or the image of linear maps were subspaces. And if n, for example, is 3, the three-dimensional space, then planes through the origin or lines through the origin are subspaces and so on. And example 3. So last time we introduced the set i, the space of all sequences, infinite sequences, and in this space we can also consider the following subset. So let a n be a sequence, an infinite sequence, so this is an element in this i of inf the space of infinite sequences, and now we can uh, have the condition that this limit n goes to infinity of this sequence exists. So this is a subspace of all infinite sequences such that this limit exists. So one example, for example, is, is, is this sequence. And here we know, for example, that the limit of this guy is just zero. So in particular, this limit exists. But of course, there are also sequences where this limit doesn't exist. So for example, if I take the sequence a n is just n, and I send n to infinity, then this thing here will blow up and the limit doesn't exist. But we have, we can consider the subspace of infinite sequences such that this limit exists, and you can, or you showed in calculus one, that this is actually a subspace of the space of all sequences, because you probably showed that if you have two sequences, a n and b n, such that the limit exists, then also the limit of the sum exists. So therefore, this condition is true. And also this condition here, so what is the zero element in this vector space i? It's just a sequence where a n is, is zero for all n, so there the limit also exists. But also if I have a <coughs> sequence where the limit exists, I can multiply it with a real number and this limit still exists. So this is an example of a subspace. And now a, a non-example, so example number four. So as an example for a vector space, we had the space of all m times n matrices. And now we can consider, for example, the subset of invertible matrices. So this is a subspace as a subset, not a subspace. So this is a subset of square matrices, so n by n matrices. But this subset is not a subspace, because almost everything goes wrong. So for example, the zero element in this space of n times n matrices is just the zero matrix, and this matrix is not invertible. But also, if I have an invertible matrix, so for example, the matrix, this matrix here, is invertible, and this matrix is also invertible, but if, the, if, the, if I add them, in this case, it's just the, the zero matrix, and this is not invertible. So this is not a subspace. <coughs> 
Okay, so now let's do a proposition for subspaces. So this is proposition uh, 1, 4. And the statement is that if I have a subspace of some vector space V, then the subspace itself is also a vector space by just using the operations coming from V. So So if u of is a subspace of V, then u is also <coughs> a vector space. With the operations inherited. So this is this follows directly from from the definition. So that so in the definition of a vector space we had these properties, these properties for addition and this compatibility conditions, and they are true in V, and then of course they are also true in U. And in the definition of subspace, we have that this u is closed under these operations, and therefore it follows directly that u with these operations is also a vector space. So I will not write anything down for the proof. Instead, we now go to definition 1.5, where we introduce again a lot of notations we already know. So V is again a vector space and now I take n elements in V <coughs> and then what we mean by the span of these elements is so the span of these elements in V is just a set of all their linear combinations. So this is a set of all the linear combinations, meaning I take all possible linear combinations, which means I take these elements v and I multiply them with some lambdas. So this is an element in v and these lambdas are real numbers. So this is the span of these vectors. And then we say that these vectors span or generate the space V if V is given by the span. So these vectors span or generate this space V if V is given by the span. Meaning every element in this vector space V is a linear combination of these n vectors V1 to Vn. And in this case, if we have if we can span a vector space V by finitely many elements, then we say that V is finitely generated. And this is a new word because in linear algebra 1 everything was finitely generated, but in this general setup there are spaces which are not finitely generated. For example, the space of all functions from R to R is a really big space and this space is not finitely generated. So uh, we say it's finitely generated, finitely generated, Gen generated, if there exists 
finitely many. So in this case, we want up to Vn such that this space V is the span of these. <clears throat> and then the next notation we also had in linear algebra 1 is when do we call such elements or vectors linearly independent. So they are called linearly linearly independent if we have the following. So every time a linear combination of them is zero, then if they are linearly independent, then this can be just be the case if all these coefficients are zero. So in this case, this means oops, that all of them of these lambdas are zero. So there's no way to find a linear combination of these vectors which is zero unless all these coefficients are zero. And then, of course, um, if we have a set of linearly independent vectors which span my space, then we call this a basis. And this is also something we had before. So, if I have a tuple like this, v1 up to vn is a basis. basis of V if these vectors are linearly independent which I abbreviate like this and if the space is spent by them. So this is exactly the same definition as before. And the only new thing here is this new word here, finitely generated. But actually everything we will deal with in this lecture, or most of this, will be finitely generated. And just the, the bigger spaces uh, will be not finitely generated, but usually we will just consider subspaces which are finitely generated. And for these, we will also consider bases. Okay, so now let's do an example. So this is example number four. And of course, this Rn we had before is finitely generated because it's the span of these vectors which we called e1 up to en. So this was just a vector which is a 1 at the first position and then e2 was a vector where had a 1 at the second position and this en has a 1 at the last position. And they are a basis of rn. So in particular they span rn and therefore rn is finitely generated because we can find finitely many elements which span it. So, but an example of something which is not finitely generated. So, the space P we had in the other example. So, again, this is the space um, of polynomial functions from R to R. So in other words, uh, these are all the functions which can be written like this as so f of x can be written as a polynomial in x. So this is polynomial of degree m if a m is not zero. <coughs> 
But this is not is not finitely generated. Because we allow any polynomial function from R to R. So how can we show that this is not finitely generated? So to show this, we assume it is finitely generated, and then we just uh, show that this contradicts, that this leads to a contradiction. So if this space would be generated by finitely many elements, let's say f1 up to f n, so if, if they are polynomial functions, so if they would generate generate p, then it would be easy to find a function which is actually not in the span of these functions. So for example, the function g of x, function g defined by g of x equals just x to the d plus 1, where d is the maximum of the degrees of these. So, oops, so this is the maximum of the degrees of f. So all of these f, they have a degree, which is uh, the maximum number m, such that these coefficients a uh, is non-zero. And I can, because it's a finite list, I can find the maximum of these degrees. But then it's easy to see that the function um, g of x, given by x to the power d plus 1, um, uh, would not be in the span of these functions. And therefore, the space is not finitely generated. So you need infinitely many elements to, to generate the space P. But if we consider a subspace, so which will also appear in the homework, so denote Pn to be the, the space of polynomial functions, so all f in p, such that the degree of f is smaller or equal to n. Then it's easy to see that this space is actually finitely generated, so this argument doesn't work anymore because all of the degrees are bounded by some n. And so this pn is finitely generated. And we can also write down a basis which I call F0 up to Fn where Fn of x it's just the function x to the power of n. Oh, fj for all j going from 0 to n. And this is the basis of this space pn. OK, so now we want to prove some propositions, lemmas, and theorems for uh, vector spaces, uh, linearly independency, span, and basis. And most of these propositions, lemmas, we already did in linear algebra 1, and therefore also most of the, the proofs are the same, except for one, which we need to adapt a little bit. But for the first one, it's exactly the same. So this is proposition um, 1.6. So if I have, again, n elements in a vector space V, then the following statements are equivalent for the wing. Uh, 
Äquivalent. And the first one is these elements v1 up to vn are linearly dependent. So they are not linearly independent. This means that there exists a non-zero vector lambda such that the linear combination of these elements is zero. This is what it means to be linearly dependent. So there is a non-trivial linear combination, which is zero. And this statement is equivalent to the following, namely that there exists a j between 1 and n, such that the span of all of these vectors, v1 up to vn, is the same as a span where I take all of them except for the j's one, so I erase one of them. So the vj I don't consider. And the span of all of them equals the span of these for 1j. This is equivalent to the fact that these vectors are linearly dependent. And the third statement is that uh, there exists a j such that vj is in the span of all where we do not include vj. Well, I just noticed in my notes one and two, uh, two and three are uh, interchanged. So don't get confused. But all of these um, statements are equivalent. And this is quite easy to see. So for example, why is 1 and 3 equivalent? Because if, if they are linearly dependent, then this means I can find a non-trivial linear combination. So this means some of these lambdas are not 0. So in particular, there's a j such that lambda j is not 0. And then there are also other lambdas, and I can bring the vj and the lambda j on one side, divide by lambda j, and then I have vj equals some linear combination of the other vectors. So in particular, this means that this vj is in the span of the other vectors. And clearly, 2 and 3 are the same, or well, they are equivalent, uh, because these spans are the same. So clearly, this is... A, is contained in this one, but why is this also contained in this one? Because if, if a vj is in the span of the others, then I can leave them out here, uh, and I, I don't change the span, because it's already contained in the span of, of all others. Okay, so this we proved in linear algebra 1, and it is exactly the same uh, it's, yeah, and it's basically what I just said. And now, uh, uh, lemma 1.7. So if v1 up to vl are linearly independent, So they are elements in some vector space V. And this V is a span of M elements, W1 up to Wm. Then we have that this L needs to be smaller than this M, smaller equals 
So in other words, if I have a space which is spanned by m elements, then inside this space I cannot find more than m linearly independent vectors. And the proof needs a little bit of adaption, and I have it in the notes, but I will leave it out here, and if you have questions we can discuss on the proof in the tutorial. Okay, so now we do theorem 1.8, which in a similar form we had before, but now we have one condition here. So this V, the vector space we consider, is not an arbitrary vector space, but V, but v needs to be uh, finitely generated. And then the first thing we get is that this has a basis. And we need to say it's a finite basis, but in this course actually every basis we consider is finite, but in a more general context one can also talk about infinite uh, basis. But in this case, um, it's a finite basis, so there are finitely many elements v1 up to vn, which span the space and which are linearly independent. But for us, basis basically always means a finite basis. And then also, what we saw before is that if I have two different bases of a space v, in the classical case, then the size of the bases are the same. So also this is true in general. All bases of a vector space V have the same number of elements. now the statement that if I have uh, linearly independent vectors in my space V, which maybe not span the whole space, but the statement is I can always add more vectors such that the, these together with the given vectors span the whole space and therefore give a basis. So, so if I have a collection of vectors beyond up to VL, which are linearly independent, Then there exist vectors VL plus one up to VN such that these Vs form a basis of our space V. And this is what we will do in the homework. So there um, you have a subspace of polynomials of degree 3, which have the property that if you plug in 1, it's 0. And this will be a subspace of all polynomials of degree 3. And for this space, um, you should find a basis. And then after this, you should extend this basis to a basis for the whole space of polynomials of degree 3. And this is exactly the statement here. If you have something linearly independent, for example, you have a basis of a subspace, they are linearly independent and they span the subspace, then you can always ask, can you extend them such that they also span the whole space? And the answer is yes. And then, somehow the other way around, if I have something which spans the space, but which is maybe not linearly independent, 
then I can throw out a few vectors and get a basis. So if my space V is spanned by some vectors W1 up to Wm, so maybe they are a basis or maybe not. So if they are not a basis, this means they are linearly dependent. And But I can find a subset of these elements such that this is a basis. So then there exists a subset u1 up to ul and this is now a subset of this of these elements v w1 up to wm such that this is a basis of v And here by the subset we also allow that this is actually the whole set of W. So if they are already linearly independent then and they span the space then they are already a basis. But if they are linearly dependent this means there is some linear combination of them, a non-trivial linear combination which is zero and therefore I can forget one of them by using the proposition we did before and I, we don't change the span and I can do this until I have something which is linearly uh, independent. And every time they are still linearly dependent I can throw one away and without changing the span and in the end uh, I will get something which is uh, linearly independent and which is then a basis of V. So this you can really do explicitly if you have one example and uh, the proof is exactly uh, what I what I just said. And also you see here that the first statement follows from this statement because V is finitely generated and therefore I can write V as a span of finitely many elements and then I can use um, this statement 4 here to actually create a basis for V. And uh, for number 2 uh, we just use the lemma we had before uh, that if I have two bases, two different bases this means uh, they both span the space and they are linearly independent and if the one number of basis elements is larger than the other one this contradicts lemma 1.7 um, because then if the, ba the one basis is, small, is bigger than the other one then I have more linearly independent uh, vectors than generators and therefore all, bases, all different bases of V have to have the same number of elements. And therefore this number here, so this is definition uh, 1.9 So if, F, uh, if V is finitely generated with basis V1 up to Vn, then because for all different bases this n is the same, uh, we say the dimension of V is defined to be this n. So this is the dimension. Okay, so now a consequence of theorem 1.8 is the following corollary. This is 1.10. So if I have an n-dimensional vector space and I have n elements then we have the following 
equivalent statements. The first statement is that um, these n elements are linearly independent. And this is equivalent because the dimension is n, and I have n linearly independent elements, that they also span already the whole space. And this follows from the theorem, um, because if, uh, if I have n linearly independent um, elements, and they wouldn't span uh, the whole space, then by theorem 1.8 number uh, 3, I could find another element in V, um, such that these together with this new element maybe span the whole space, and which are a basis, but then I would get a higher dimension than n. And therefore, um, they already need to span the whole space. And uh, number three, which is just combination of these two, if I have elements which span the whole space and which are linear independent, they are they form a basis, so this is a basis. And all these three um, statements are equivalent. So one always follows from the other. And now another proposition. So, if I have a finitely generated um, vector space V, and I have a subspace of V, then the statement is that U, the subspace, is also finally generated. And this proposition also follows from proposition 1.6 and lemma 1.7, but I will also skip um, the proof here. And uh, so now we can use this proposition, um, or we first do an example. So example number five. So for example, the space of M times N matrices, this space is finitely generated and has a basis which I denote E i j for i going from 1 to m and j going from 1 to n, where this uh, E i j are the matrices which are zero everywhere except at one position, namely at the column um, J and at the row I. And clearly this is a basis, so they are linearly independent. This is obvious, because every time I have a linear combination of them which is zero, then Eij has zeros everywhere except for here, and he, this matrix is the only one having something here. So if the linear combination is a zero matrix, the coefficient of this also needs to be zero. Uh, 
And also they span the whole space because every matrix can be written as a linear combination of these matrices. I mean, for example, the matrix 1, 3, 0, 0 is 1 times the matrix. So this is uh, E11 one, one, plus 3 times this matrix 0, 0, 0, 1, which is E22. Uh, two, two. And therefore, this is a basis, but how many elements does this basis have? Well, it has m times n elements, and therefore the dimension of the vector space of m times n matrices is n times n. And example number two, this extremely big space of all functions from R to R is not finitely generated. Because of proposition 111, we know if we have a vector space V, and uh, which is finitely generated, and a subspace, then the subspace also needs to be finitely generated. But in this case, we already saw that we have the subspace of all polynomial function, which is not finitely generated, and therefore the whole space is also not finitely generated. So this is a usage of this um, proposition. So in other words, there, I mean, it could be the case that for these functions from R to R, there could be finitely many really strange functions, such that any function from R to R can be written as a linear combination of these really fancy functions, but this is not the case um, because already we, we saw a subspace which is not finally generated. Okay, so the last thing we will do in the first lecture is a proposition and definition. And this proposition is again similar to what we had in linear algebra one. Namely, if I have a basis of a vector space, this just means that every element in this vector space can be written as a unique linear combination of these basis elements. So, if I have a basis, e1 up to the n, the basis of a vector space v, then this means, or this implies, that for every element in this vector space, there exist unique numbers, lambda 1 up to lambda n, such that this element u is given by this linear combination lambda i times uh, vi. So every element in the vector space can be written as a unique linear combination of the basis elements. And this follows from the propositions and theorems we had before. And with this, we can give the following definitions. So if we fix a basis, then each element in this vector space um, gives us these numbers, lambda 1 to lambda n, and these are called the coordinates of this element u with respect to the space b. So with the same notations as here, um, these lambdas are called, called the coordinates of u in the basis b. So if I change the basis, if I choose a different basis, of course these numbers change, but if we fix the basis, then each element u gives a unique set of numbers, uh, lambda 1 to lambda n, where n is the dimension of the vector space uh, in the basis b. And then 
we also give um, this vector containing these numbers a name, which is a coordinate vector, and we denote it by the element u, and here we say which basis we choose, and this is a vector lambda 1 uh, to lambda n, and this is an element in Rn. So no matter what the vector space is, it could be a vector space of functions, or matrices, or sequences, if this has a basis, for example, if we choose polynomials of degree smaller or equal to n, then we can find a basis. And each polynomial can be written as a unique linear combination. So to each polynomial, we can assign a vector. So somehow from this new story with arbitrary objects, we go back and get an object in the world we lived in, in linear algebra 1, in this Rn. And this will be see later that uh, this is also how we will describe linear maps. Linear maps in these general spaces will also have to do with, uh, with matrices, because we can always transfer these general objects back to uh, the usual vectors we had before. And this is what we will do in lecture 2, where we will start with defining what a linear map is. The definition will again be the same, but to go to the matrix of a linear map, we will need to use, use this setup here.